a new Pentecost. The sound of a whirling wind fills the house that fear inhabits. Come, come again, we cry. Break into the cramped rooms where our hesitant hearts are hiding. Decimate indecisiveness. Demolish all self-righteousness. Dismantle false securities, rigidities, ideologies. Redirect our dependencies and reconstruct our religious lives, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. Not from outside in, but from the inside out, as it was in the beginning of the tradition in which we stand. Can you imagine the mess that would make? <laughs> no more than the mess we are making now. No worse than the mess we are in. Where spirit is, there is chaos and a call for implicate order, made manifest through the relentless demands of divinity in and around us. O oh, holy, hallowed spirit, reckless as a sudden storm, comforting as a mother's kiss, we have felt your stirring deep within us so many times in so many ways and staggered beneath your coerciveness as you called forth from inexperience the unexplained and the unexpected. Blow away the accretions of complacency and indifference and restore originating energy and unconditional grace. Come now and let us feel the freedom of your presence, the flaming of your passion, the full force of your power, to shake and shape body and soul and heart and mind and spirit like a fire in the belly, igniting a spark in our senses and our psyches, compelling us to tell the world of all that we have witnessed, of all that we have experienced, even before we find the words and can only babble about belonging, about becoming all-inclusive, all caught up in the wake of an all-encompassing love and the chance to begin again. Spirit of the living God, you know where to find us and precisely how to reach us. Engendering Pentecost anew as you blow to bits again and again our precious presuppositions in order to pave a path here and now for a radically new creation in spirit and in truth. I should sit down because that says it all. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually very, I'm overwhelmed at being here in this, at this moment in this place and the incredible spirit of this community, of all of you, Thank you for blessing me before I leave planet Earth for the next realm, whatever or wherever that is. Um, I came up, I'm up in the pulpit, I'm here, up here in the pulpit because I can be here at Princeton. Okay. is why I'm also so overwhelmed and I am wearing this Princeton robe because it's the only robe I have and it's the only one I want. <laughs> um, we, uh, and the theme of this conference is so spirit inspired that you invited me to come and com con contribute something to the incomplete story <laughs> to complete the story because I want to add my page to the story of women at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, and so forgive me, but it's going to be a little bit of a personal 
story through, and you will see the role that Princeton has played. Most of what you saw at the table, almost all of it, yesterday is post Princeton's PhD. Um, it's, it is a gift I received, um, the courage to follow what the Spirit kept telling me to do <laughs> informally and take ever and ever new steps, okay? It all began when I was a little girl, maybe the age of seven. My grandparents were immigrants, uh, their parents were immigrants from Europe. Um, my grandmother's father owned a saloon in Passaic, New Jersey, and we lived over the saloon. And that's where I learned to like play the piano, and when men were in their cups, they'd bang on the radiator so I could play a Hungarian chartarsh for those, you know, <laughs> the, as the night went on. My other grandparents had a lovely little farm in Catskill Mountains, and that's where I spent my summers. And I was in both places more like a hermit, because I liked to be alone. I liked to be, I liked to be just writing poems and reflecting and I didn't, I needed no things, I, I just, and in the Catskill Mountains I would at night just come and listen to the night music, the orchestra, the bubs and the beetles and watch the fireflies and look up at the stars and I could never ever imagine heaven as a place or I just, I never, I looked up and I was one with the stars which is incredible that at the end I would end up really embracing astrophysics to the degree I have. <laughs> No knowledge, but this incredible energy connection that something was happening. I was being led some way beyond my comprehension. Anyway, when I got turned seven, you know, I got religion. <laughs> A little Roman Catholic girl lighting candles, you know, praying to the Blessed Mother, saying my rosaries, being such a really good girl. Oh, it was just wonderful. I was just so holy. But the thing that troubled me, <laughs> The thing that absolutely troubled me, that gnawed the, the pain, the fire in the belly, was my grandma was Protestant and my grandpa with the saloon, you know. But every time when my grandfather found out she had snuck, you know, a, a soda up, she would, she would sneak soda up when he was sleeping in the morning and she, on Sunday she would wash the old glasses and she'd take two bottles, you know, and sneak them up to us so we children could have some soda from the bar, you know. Um, that God would consign her to hell because that was the teaching and the preaching. And I don't know what it is now, but I don't listen to those things anymore <laughs> um, because I, never, I could not believe that, you know. And so that little seed sown within me. So religion got, I got religion, but then believe it or not, I don't know how it happened, religion got me. And the reason it got me was I ain't gonna be no nun like those, you know, who I don't, first of all, I, the one thing I made very, very clear I did not want to do was teach. I was never going to teach, I said to God. So we had these vocation fairs, you know, in Catholicism. You'd go to this place and all the orders would sort of, you know, just like a kind of, you know, sales thing, I don't know. And we would collect the brochures and put them in a bag. So my girlfriend and I were sorting them all. I'm going, teaching, 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 into the garbage, into the garbage, ding, 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 no way. We get down to the final two, Mary Knoll, which is a wonderful group. They're international, do all kinds of stuff. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor and go to Africa. I actually wanted to work with the Zulus or anybody in Africa. Um, that was my goal. And so, and the last one came up, Medical Mission Sisters. And they did doctors and nursing school and all, but there no teaching, like it was just. <laughs> so, I'm 16, right, about ready to graduate, so I go and I, long story short, I entered. I entered, and um, it was a kind of a very turbulent time, just pre-Vatican II, you know, and it was wonderful. I got my training, I, um, I made my commitment, and then we were very much into the liturgical movement, of liturgical music, so we sang all the chants and everything, and all the lovely Palestrina motets and, and uh, from the uh, Renaissance period. And when Vatican II said, we're go the changes are gonna come, the head of our society at that time said, somebody has got to study music. 
and the fickle finger of fate fell on me. <laughs> I was absolutely, they said, and the beautiful thing was said, would you be willing? Now, how many women like would say, no, I'm not willing to do some would. I'm not hardwired that way. So I did my heartbreaking and all. I went off to Catholic University, but I had already been almost ready. I was almost finished with pre-med, ready to go to med school. We transferred. So any of you who know music, I had two years under my belt. I had two years to learn all of the prerequisites and master an instrument and give a public performance, of which I had no instrument, you know. <laughs> Long story short, I made it through, uh, fell in love again with the chants and the Gregorian chant and all of the Palestrina stuff, and gave my recital in the Cathedral of Mary Our Queen in Baltimore with four manuals, 189 stops. I made sure nobody would be there but a few of my friends. <laughs> and I'm up in, the, up in the balcony, right, and I got my habit on, and my organ teacher is here, a really master of music. I said, he said, you're ready? I said, yeah, and I threw up my habit and I had pants underneath. I thought he was gonna fall over the railing. Uh, he said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. He said, stop it, stop it, I'm nervous enough, just stop it. I said, I'm like a crab with four appendages. I gotta do this and that, I got four men. I need my two feet <laughs> in the middle. So he calmed down, you have to turn the pages. He calmed down, we, I gave the thing. Toward the end, in the pastoral, of Cesar Frank's pastoral, we're up in the balcony. The, 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 the uh, Angelus, bong, 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 and then bong, 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 bong. I made it through. I know they never wanted to see me again, so I got my degree. And you know what? I never played another note. We were too poor to own it. And what would missionaries do with an organ? We can hardly carry a guitar, you know? <laughs> so there I am at the mother house. And they said, well, we'll assign you to teach the novices. You might as that's like the curse of death, you know? <laughs> teach the novices what? You know? And so all I know, I'm, and then out comes the thing that, that finally Rome says, you know, Vatican II had done the liturgical uh, document. And then the United States bishop said, as of November, all we will go into English, okay? So all my, and one of the older sisters, she meant well, she says, well, but, oh, what a pity, MT. Uh, your degree is useless now, isn't it? <laughs> Not only the degree felt useless, me, my, what was I gonna do? So I was just, I'm screaming to God, what, what, what? And then this was this hootenanny music out and I said, Lord, save us. I gave on 189th stop. I could sure play three chords on a guitar and do something. And so I started to sing songs. <laughs> and that's the beginning of that. And sobbing, people all love joys like the rain. All over the world, anywhere I've ever gone, it's gotten there before me. But it was Christ asleep within my boat, whipped by winds, yet still afloat. I'm screaming to Jesus. I made my final vows. What good am I? I'm going nowhere. And even the novices said, we don't want you to teach us. You, you know too much Latin. We're, they were into the new age things, just like today, you know. I'm already old fashioned. I hadn't even gotten out of the chute. Um, <laughs> so for some reason, I guess they let me go abroad to some of our missions. And then the beauty of just having African girls all dressed up in all their colorful, you know, standing up in four part harmony, saying, I cannot come to the banquet, you know all over in all different denominations, even Catholics, uh, Old Order Mennonites, Amish. Uh, they found an album in the Khyber Pass, a story, you know, I mean, all over the place. So I come back, but still, what am I gonna do? I mean, I came to be a missionary. This is like ridiculous. And I ended up uh, doing something in McMaster. And the president said, why don't you come and study with us? I said, you know, I'm so sick of Catholics. Why don't I learn something about the Protestant biggies, you know? So I got my master's degree from there. And then uh, I ended up applying to Princeton. This is such an unbelievable story. Princeton, I love you. Why? I want to know, why did you even accept me? I had no back. I had, they said, where else did you apply? Nowhere. 
why are you coming here? Because it's close to my mother house. <laughs> that's, all my, that's all I had. <laughs> and a few LP records, a bunch of those behind me. I mean, what good is that? I'm coming into like theological education. I want a PhD. You know, so there's a kind of big flurry. But you know what? They accepted me. They accepted me. And, and, you know, I said, I want to study all, I want to get to know all the Protestant worship traditions. Okay. And then I did my dissertation on studying, look, looking for is there or is there not a theology of Catholic church music? Because I couldn't find any. So I began my search. I read thousands of things. I searched, looked in Europe. I looked everywhere. I studied, I got every papal document. I got all of everything, went through all of this. And at the end, the final conclusion, which this school validated, there is no theology. There's a theological, there is an, I call it an aesthetic because the point is sacred music for, oh, it sounds like the angels or the heavenly choir. Okay, just give me a recording of one heavenly choir or one angel actually singing. <laughs> Which one of you can give me the proof? You know, where is the proof of this? So that was the strength of the argument. And this was like in the wake of Vatican II, right? All of this, and they had all these documents. So I took their documents on, you know. They had allowed folk music in, and, but, but reluctantly, you know. And I was banned. I cannot tell you how many places I was banned. Doors were shut. It's the only hymnal, tradition hymnal, in this country, that my, in America, the United States, that, my, that does not have my hymns is here in America, in this United States. It's in Canada, everywhere else. And you know, I'm so happy because I don't need that. I don't need that. It's in the underground. It's in the classrooms. It's on the camps. It's around the world. It's in the missions. And it's not about songs. It's about the message. It's about everybody singing together. It's about making music. It's about having fun. It's about dancing and clapping. So I went back to Africa, and I got all of that energy there, OK? But I also got another big piece, two really important pieces, falling in love always with the universe and, and the beauty of God's creation and planet Earth and all of that. But I went to refugee camps, and I, I was the very day that I completed successfully my orals here, which, you know, that's like a transition out of, you know, purgatory into, <laughs> or hell, which are whenever you can get out of faster. Um, I go home to the mother house, and I was, and they, and I was, I was so thrilled. I was going to say, I'm free, I'm free, free. Um, and someone announced, who is free to go to the Thai-Cambodia border? Pol Pot's regime just fell. We need an emergency relief team. Who's free? And I said, I'm free, I'm free. And I said, what on earth am I good for? Who needs a liturgist and a singer of songs in Cambodia? And you know what? And I said, I want to go, but what am I? And they said, well, we always need somebody to help us out, you know. So come and just do whatever. So me and, and, and so I went to do whatever. And it transformed me forever. We were assigned the infectious diseases ward, which was 100 beds and 140 women and children. I mean, destitute, nobody speaking, nobody anything, just comatose. And, um, you know, you do the meds and all. And after the second day, I said, this is like, you know, I got to do something. So I got up and I grabbed the hand of one little child. And he's like, and I said, we're going to have a parade. And I began marching around the floor. And it, this is grass hut, and it's open to all the other. I started singing, and I started clapping, and then some, I did it two days in a row. Third day, I came, and I came to the camp to get sign in, because it was a military. There were guards and guns, and we had to turn in our badges and all. Coming up the road, this gaggle of kids running, screaming, laughing, throw their hands around my legs, and, my, and I thought, if you want to know the meaning of Easter, and resurrection, and coming to life, and the fullness of life, that's it. So I learned my most powerful lessons liturgically from the refugee camps there and in Ethiopia, where I went when the famine time. And the children who were 
you know, mothers were trying to give me, take my baby with you so he will live, you know, that kind of thing. And the sense of the, the dead coming back to life. And um, it was Christmas in that first ward. And I said, we got to have something Christmas Eve, you know, we got to do something. A barefoot priest walked in from the north. He said, does anybody, would you like a mass? I said, oh yeah, we'd like a mass, come. So all, everybody from the ward, the workers, we crammed into this thing. You know what the decor was? Empty bedpans, all on the, the bedpan was the storage thing, the tent. He celebrated, we broke bread, and then he said, who will preach the sermon? And everybody looks at me. <laughs> I mean, with this, there were 10 different countries and languages, and I'm dog tired after a 12 hour shift, filthy in my jeans, I stood up, and again, Spirit just said, if Jesus were born at a time, this particular moment, he would have come in a place such as this. This is the meaning of Christmas. It's not all the stuff we do, all of the tinsel and everything else. This is the heart of Christmas because what is being born is a whole new way, a whole new potential and possibility. So my my academic setting <laughs> was on hold, and I built up and, and, and filled in for myself what I needed of those cultures and countries and situations that speak so much to my heart, and singing songs and doing that kind of stuff. So I get this call to go to Hartford. That was the most insane. Everything is insane. Nothing makes sense. <laughs> Nothing makes sense, which is why chaos is like that. It doesn't, it's not a Newtonian ABC will give you D. It's a quantum leap. You cannot imagine what's going to come. I go to, I, I turn them down four times. They call me. I said, why are you calling me? Because you know why also? I hadn't even done my uh, um, oral thing. I was only in the second year of residency. First of all, I don't want a job. I don't want to teach. Does anybody listening? <laughs> So I go up, they, they wouldn't stop calling, so I'm gonna go up and tell them in person. I stand up, I kid you not. This is, the irony of this whole thing is so ridiculous. I stand in this room filled with all the students and professors and the Archdiocese of Hartford's res, representatives because they were going to inter, inter uh, uh, add, put in a new track for Roman Catholic priests to get a doctor of ministry and they needed a Catholic. So they choose a woman <laughs> who cannot preach in their church, who cannot celebrate, who's in charge of teaching liturgy. This is insane. So I said, I don't want this job, I said. I'm only here because they're not listening to me here. I do not want this job. So ask me anything. I'll tell you anything you want to know that I can tell you. The next day I go home, I get the call. You're our unanimous choice. What? <laughs> I've learned long ago not to follow logic when you're following, the spirit is not logical. The spirit is not logical. When it seems the most ridiculous, pay attention. Don't try to understand it, but don't run away from it. So I thought, oh, what the heck, I gotta do my dissertation somewhere. And they had just gotten computers in, the old one with the little dots, you know, and the big, I could work on a computer, which actually gave my advisor a heart attack. He couldn't believe I got it done so, you know, around so fast. Um, the first thing I did, I opened the dictionary, the Oxford Unabridged. I'm teaching spiritual. I opened it up to get the definition with the Protestants understand, because they're all Protestants, no Catholics. I'm the only woman, the only Catholic on the faculty, the only nun, God help us, and the, and the only folk singer to boot. So I opened the book, <laughs> and it says, the definition of spirituality. Do you know what that was back then? The, the whole body of the clergy. And the plural, the money collected to give to the whole body of clergy, spiritualities. I Xeroxed that page because I said, please God, this will change or I'm quitting, you know. Uh, they didn't, they had, that's what it was. And also, spiritual is opposite to material, which means matter is here and spirit is there. Total separation. I said, I really have work to do. I can't do liturgy, I can't do spirituality. So I began, that's why this compulsion 
to, to produce so many things. I had nothing to work with. So I started from scratch and had all the best feminist speakers in and all the best uh, women of color. And, and once when we had the big anniversary in America, Native Americans, I designed a whole thing to celebrate and invited 15 different Native American. And when they came and they said, what's our role? I said, come a day early. I said, I don't know, I'm leaving. Um, the whole program is yours. They said, what are we going to do? I, don't, I said, they said, we've never, our men wouldn't allow us to do that. I said, well, you're not with your men, girlfriend. You know? <laughs> do something or there's no program. It was incredible, right? So it's sort of like having, if you trust the spirit, you know, you go to the edge of forever and ever and you leap and you trust that something will catch you. And that, and, and what I have learned that, and I've, I've been so, I've been able to do what I've been able to do because of this Princeton Theological Seminary degree. Way back when, the few of us who were female here say, we've really got to master uh, learn the tools of the master. Use the, if we're gonna, just, we have, if we're gonna deconstruct the master's house, we've got to learn the tools. But you got those same tools are what we need to have to build the new house of our own. You know, we have to be able to be both and. We can't be either or. We're women and they're men. We have to understand both sides. Women have to do that. I'm a Gemini. It helps. <laughs> You know, that I can, these both sides work. So for me, the complete, everything I moved on into, uh, the women and, and um, the, 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 the women's movement, I do not want to be ordained. I have never aspired to that. I say to people, and I believe it from the core of my being, I am ordained. I am ordained by the Spirit of God to celebrate the liturgy of life. Amen. Liturgy of life. And if the food in the food centers that make their way into hungry uh, children's bellies and homes, if that isn't Eucharist, I don't know what is. And to validate that conviction, then I did a whole thing on Jesus, you know. And all oh my glory, do we have the work to do? <laughs> uh, Jesus filled. Just remember this one thing, because you don't need all of this. You know, you got to go home. Um, <laughs> Jesus was filled with the Spirit from the beginning. Filled with the Spirit. The reign of God, he said, he wasn't pointing up there. He said, the reign of God, the, it's within you. And when he healed, he didn't have, you know, the abracadabra kind of thing. He said, you have the potential to heal yourself. The power to heal is within you, you know. It's within all of us. The Spirit with is within the Spirit is within all of us to do what God wants us to do. And when we are not, if we can get out of the Newtonian way of A, B, C, if you do A, B, and C, D, the end will come. You know, throw out the five-year plans. You can't even get through a five-month plan. <laughs> throw out all the plans. Your plans are not working because in a quantum universe, it's not paradigm shift from paradigm to new paradigm to new paradigm, which is immovable structure or a set of laws that have a framework. It's paradox, meaning it's not either this or that. It is both this and that. And at the core of that inconceivable non-logic is energy. And now when you see all that the young people are doing, they are building their lives were a uh, reality on internet stuff, which at the core of what they do is energy. They are so into energy, they're outpacing us, not how they apply it is not the issue. The fact they're using the mechanism, we should be using that. We had energy and spirit first before we had internet. You know, the energy of the universe, the energy of all of everywhere, energy on planet Earth, there is energy. And we need to harness that energy and make it work for us and just trust the spirit. If you said I would ever be back here <laughs> and stand in this pulpit and speak these words to you, I would say, huh? <laughs> no. But I am so grateful to the core that 
this little untold story got tacked on to the story of Princeton because it began here. It gave me the confidence and the courage and, the, and developed the capacity to do things that I couldn't know were right to do until I looked back and said, oh yeah, that was good. Now I'm on to the next one. So I pass that blessing on to you. May you do likewise. Be courageous, be imaginative, trust the spirits, and when you look back, that's when you start counting your chickens. <laughs> you know, when you look back, don't count ahead, A, B, and C. Looking back is good every once in a while, and then do it with deep gratitude and deep praise. Okay, thank you. Let us um, sing a final blessing. I would invite you to stand, okay? And just repeat what you hear from me. <laughs> Hopefully, something coherent. It's a call and response. The first words are, sing, we sing of a blessing. You don't have anything. See, you gotta trust the spirit already. I'm testing you now. <laughs> sing, we sing of a blessing. Sing, we sing of a blessing. Sing, we sing of a blessing. A blessing of love, a blessing of mercy, love will increase, a blessing of peace, share now, share in the blessing, share now, share in the blessing, A blessing of joy, a blessing of justice, love will increase, a blessing of peace, pray now, pray for a blessing, pray now, pray for a blessing, A blessing of hope, a blessing of courage, love will increase, a blessing of peace, live, live, live as a blessing, live, live, live as a blessing. Blessing among us, love will increase. A blessing of peace. Send forth, send forth a blessing. Send forth, send forth a blessing. A blessing to all, now and forever, love will increase, a blessing of peace, love will increase, a blessing of peace.